Oh, hey, uh, homebrewers, mead makers, and cider makers. I'm Kevin I'm from the Dukes of Ale. We're a or homebrew club in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, I'm getting ready to enter some beers in one of our competitions. So, uh, and we'll talk about inner tubes and beer a little bit later in the section. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, uh, at least from my perspective, uh, there's a di lot of different ways to get your beers ready for competitions. And uh, I think uh, there's some good methods and, and maybe some that uh, maybe aren't quite ideal. Uh, one of the things that I do like to do is uh, enter competitions. I think for me winning a medal is the second most important thing. The real important thing to me is getting some really good feedback from very seasoned judges that are, you know, experts in their field and uh, experts in, in the uh, home brewing as well as picking out subtle flaws and subtle good things in the beers. Um, what we're going to do here is just kind of make the entry method a little bit less daunting. I know for me when I first started entering it was kind of overwhelming. How do you fill a beer so you don't just have a flat beer that just was mostly foam? Um, sanitation, um, presenting your beer the best you can, the correct style, and a lot of different uh, beers can actually fit in more than one style, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the one thing I kind of really want to focus on too is the brewing software. Uh, I met a good, pretty good um, judge Nelson Crowley. Uh, he's actually a nationally ranked BJCP judge, and uh, he and I got to to be friends in Colorado judging up there. And he also is um, a good programmer too, and he wrote a pretty neat software package called Reggie Beer. And Reggie Beer is uh, meant to catalog beers for multiple hundreds of beer competition uh, entries. So. Uh, it looks pretty neat, and we're just going to go through that step by step, um, how you'd enter the beers. Uh, some of the important things, too, is descriptors. So you may have some specialty beers, uh, fruit beers, things that need a few brief words into it. And we're going to go over that, to how you'd write those in and make it uh, as brief and concise, but as accurate as possible. Um, we're also going to touch on some things like entering beers. Uh, uh, for some of the competitions uh, in the future. You want to have beers that are perfectly sanitized as well as you can. Uh, keep in mind these beers aren't going to sit in your kegerator at 32 degrees until you get ready to drink them. They're going to be in bottles and they may sit for some length of time close to room temperature. Uh, you just don't know. So that's where any kind of flaws in the beers may start to show. Uh, so we're going to go through a few steps here, a few different segments and uh, we'll have some place markers for time on the uh, presentation. And if you want to skip some of the things, maybe just go to bottling or just going to the counter pressure filling or the competition entry, uh, those time markers will be at the bottom. So jump right to them and, and go, go to those. So uh, stay with us and uh, hopefully we can show you one or two good tips. Okay, so this part is uh, the bottling, uh, sanitation, and uh, general preparation for your beers to get ready to go in the competition. You know, keep in mind, uh, sanitation is probably, I would say, at least as important as the fermentation, the entire beer style characteristics. Uh, a lot of times you have little bugs that tend to like to uh, get in there and ferment out your beers uh, well beyond what you thought you want to have your beers fermented at. Uh, bugs like the lactobacillus, things like that, they can get in there and uh, you don't realize it when you bottle it that they're in there, but they're very subtle. And over time, over the weeks that the beer may sit there and become uh, more and more infected, if you want to call it that, uh, the flavors are going to become more prominent as you get to the judging section, so you could be very surprised at the low scores you may have had based on the beer you have. Even beer that you get out of the keg that was from the same kegging, it's a far different cry when it's sitting at 32 degrees and undisturbed in the keg rather than being in a bottle. So uh, we'll talk about a few things that actually have worked for me for sanitation, and you may have some 
things that work better for you. Um, there's a lot of good tips and, and things out there in the in the homebrewing world. So um, I'll just share with you what what's worked for me. Um, first thing I like to do because uh, some of the things are a little bit caustic is I like to wear gloves. Um, you can get the regular gloves that are, um, are reusable, wear many times, um, something like these. These are a lot more tactile. They feel, feel pretty good and they're cheap enough where once you're done you can throw them away. The other thing's advantage too is this is a bucket of star sand, which is a sanitizer, and I can dip these gloves right in it, always keep my hands clean and not have to worry about what did I just touch. So I keep everything meticulously clean that I think I'm going to touch the bottle. Uh, I've got a bottle of star sand here that I always keep pre-mixed so it's ready to go. Um, and what I do just before I start to, uh, to work on my, my uh, bottling is I'll go ahead and spray this down. I'll even spray the, the surrounding area so if there might be any yeast or bugs that are floating that might uh, take them out of the uh, out of the air and get them out of your your brewing area. Um, so star sand is one I use. There's a lot of other ones. Ida Four is another example. Um, everybody has their own favorite. I just kind of grew up with star sand. Um, it's a good sanitizer. You can have it in your bottle and not have to rinse it out. So it's a no rinse cleaner. So I like that quite a bit. Um, got a squirt bottle for squirting into the, the bottles to clean it. Um, I like PBW, it's called Pub and Bar Works, and it works really well, but in a pinch, if, if you don't have that, uh, you can use an unscented OxyClean. They're kind of similar cousins to each other. Both of them are based on uh, what's called sodium, per car or sodium peroxide, or sorry, um, it's a sodium percarbonate. So basically, that does the sanitizing, cleans things pretty well. So it's a pretty nice uh, way to clean things, and it's not too too toxic otherwise. A few other things uh, for cleaning inside bottles: if you're using used bottles, uh, you'll want to have some sort of cleaning mechanism. You want to really check those closely. Uh, bottles that have been used and uh, basically haven't been cleaned, have been sitting with dried crud at the bottom, it's pretty hard to clean without mechanical means, so bottle cleaners, paper towels, um, and uh, pretty much you know, we're ready to go. What I would say is um, I would go with new bottles if, if you can swing the, the extra cost. Uh, if not, then go ahead and get the used bottles. Uh, you can soak bottles in either the start uh, OxyClean or other just hot water works pretty well. Clean off all the outside labels. Uh, you really don't want to send a beer in with labels. Uh, it's possible it could be disqualified. Uh, and the reason for that, other than being unsightly, it just kind of looks like somebody really didn't take a lot of time to prepare this beer. Um, it actually can be a giveaway. So if somebody's judging that they also have the beers in a competition, they say, oh yeah, that's my my Miller High Life uh, bottle that I have scraped it off, you know, you don't want to be giving that away. So scrape those off, soak the bottles, and uh, better yet, just use new ones. We're okay with bottles like this. They have a precast uh, ring there. You know, some competitions won't let you use that, but, but you know, we're going to allow it in our competition. So um, any of these things work well. So the first thing you want to do is uh, mix up your uh, sanitizer and dip your bottle into it, keep them soaked. Um, this happens to be OxyClean. Um, and once you get that done, drain them real well, clean them out. And if you want to, you can go ahead and clean them if they're really pretty dirty. You can take a, a brush and uh, dip it in there and, and hand use it. So these brushes are fairly inexpensive. It's important to find one has the tip bristles and not flat because you can start to, you know, put metal against glass. I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I put a little bend on the bristle and what that does is it allows the inside curve to get it in underneath this little shoulder. You don't typically see a lot of crud there unless the bottle was laid down after it was drank and now you have junk sitting down there. 
So once you get to that point, uh, you, you can you want to fill your bottle with uh, with your your cleaning agent. So you have a little bit at the bottom there, and cut the end off. And this little plastic piece here, that's just nothing more than that quarter inch air conditioner tubing that you can get at the Home Depot, Lowe's store, some of those hardware stores. And then just put that in there and go ahead and I kind of like turn it sideways. It gets the, the uh, sanitizer up inside there rather than at the very bottom. So it's working real well like that. And then uh, dump the bottle out. I'm just going to dump it in here for the video purposes, but anytime it's dirty, drop it out. And just take a really good look with some backlight in there. Make sure there's absolutely nothing in there. And this looks pretty clean, so this would be ready to go. And you can do similar things with the other bottles. So once we get to that point, the bottles are clean. I kind of like to wash them out with regular tap water and turn them upside down. Uh, you can use a fast rack or homemade uh, system to drain out the liquid. But you want to have these things clean, pretty well drained out. And at this point, you can go a di few different methods. Um, I've got a star sand in a squeeze bottle, uh, whatever works well for you. And uh, you want to dip your hands in your sanitizer. So, you know, uh, if this were filled with star sand, dip your gloves in there, put your thumb on there, and give that a good shake around and uh, there's nothing to say she, you can't put the bottle there for a few hours until you're ready and then once you're completely done again dump this out throw it away don't don't be reusing it especially for competitions the other important thing to to know too keep a good look around here if you have used these bottles or somebody's used them before and you can uh, take a paper towel just dip it in the sanitizer, just make sure that's clean. I've seen bottles in competitions that had crud right there, and it's very possible the crud could be up on top of that neck and then uh, drop into your beer. And after a little while, now you have uh, a pseudobacter that changes your American uh, pale ale into an American wild sour ale uh, by accident. So, anyway, once you get all these done, again, turn them upside down. Uh, make sure everything is drained out as well as possible. If you're using star sand, it's not as big a deal as you really uh, need to with some of the other um, materials that aren't uh, compatible having some of it inside. So once you get to that point, you'll have all your bottles set up in, in your rows. Um, you really want to get to your bottles once you sanitize them within about 12 hours. So you don't want to go too much longer than that. If you do, then you want to just real quick wash and rinse them uh, so that you didn't have any bugs sneak back in in that time. Um, star sand is uh, basically it's based on an acidic nature to kill the bugs. It's a uh, phosphoric acid base with uh, another acid that actually is what's called an anionic type of reaction. So when you when you clean things with star sand, turn them upside down. There's really very little or no water droplets because it's uh, the ionic action allows the water to drain completely so it looks like you ran up through a dishwasher. So anyway, we're at this point where we can uh, go to the next phase. So just to recap, sanitization or sanitation is you know very key to this. Uh, pay very close attention to any kind of goop in the bottles. If you can use new, new bottles all the better. Uh, Go ahead and use your cleaner first if they're used bottles. Wash that out, rinse it, use your sanitizer second, and now you're at the phase of uh, get ready to fill those bottles of beer. Hey all, Kevin here again for the second part of our uh, beer competition entry. As you remember in the previous segment, uh, we talked about sanitizing and all the prep for bottles used uh, and new bottles. Um, of course, when you're uh, talking about sanitizing and cleaning, you want to 
sanitize and clean everything that comes in contact with your beer. That, uh, that includes, in this case, counter pressure filler, the cork, the, the, the tube, the fill tube, um, keg, this is a ball walk keg, this is an adapter to go to the gas line. Uh, I'm very meticulous about cleaning everything on here. Uh, kegs as well, the top valves and uh, the inside of the keg prior to, uh, to putting the beer in it. So there's a, there's a lot of things to, to keep in, in mind, but all these little things can you know, mess up a beer you spent a lot of time on and had a lot of pride for. So uh, kind of give you an overview of what we have. This is a counter pressure filler. And uh, actually, you probably, if you know me, you know I kind of like to build my own stuff. I don't know if this is any better or worse than a commercial counter pressure filler. I really like these for filling beer. A little more expensive, you need a CO2 source, but uh, eventually if you get to this point, it'll make your life way more easy than uh, non-pressure filling. Uh, these are bottle caps, and I keep these in a, just a little uh, mason jar. So we've got a mason jar full of uh, oxygen barrier bottle caps, so these actually have a a little plastic uh, insert which absorbs oxygen, so it's kind of an oxygen scavenger, not really a barrier. Um, these will take up uh, the oxygen in the head space of your beer, so it's kind of handy to have. I keep them in a mason jar, and uh, it's kind of handy to keep them in here because it keeps them airtight, so you want to keep moisture away from it, um, and this, this is kind of a nice way to do it. Um, a few other things, of course, the sanitizer. Um, this is a bucket of ice water, so if you decide that you don't want to go with counter pressure filling yet, uh, you really want to have your bottles as cold as possible. It's going to make a huge difference on how much foam you're going to produce when you go ahead and fill up your bottles. So, a bucket of ice water. Um, bucket of star sand. So, things get dipped in here, including my hands. Uh, any of the ball lock uh, pieces. So the airlock even, uh, the gas line, gap, uh, the uh, liquid line. I got a bottle of star sand, already pre-mixed, I keep this around all the time. Um, I like to spray the, the ends here just to make sure that uh, those are also sanitized when you click on. You're going to need to, to keep all these things really spotless. So let's go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about the setup here. Got a CO2 line that's set at the same pressure as your kegs. If you have a, a difference, you want to have this set equal to, or even better yet, slightly higher pressure if you need to. If it's at a lower pressure, or your tank's at a lower pressure, this is um, could drive your, once you try to fill your bottle with counter pressure filler, it could drive the beer back into your keg, which is not too bad, but if you have yeast and trube and things like that settle out, it's going to throw it all back in suspension which can take weeks to settle back out. So keep in mind of your pressures and we'll talk about a little, a couple tips on how you keep your pressures uh, from backflowing your, your, your keg. So let's go ahead and start with our bottles. These have been sanitized. We can just keep them dipped in here. Um, one or two, doesn't really matter too much. Just keep in mind that you don't want the next uh, having any trouble as far as getting uh, water or anything that's not sanitized in there. So once you keep the bottles cool, you get ready to, to do the filling. And uh, I'll take a few caps out and put them on here just so I can get quick access to it. Yeah, this is my, my bottle uh, capper. I haven't had any trouble with it. I think there's other fancier ones, but yeah, this works out pretty well for me. And first thing we're going to do is we're going to sanitize the, uh, the filler. I'm going to go with the counter pressure filler first, and then we'll go with the more conventional filler. So this tank over here, uh, these don't have uh, 
labels on that are as obvious as some of the other tanks. So what I did is I put some white tape on the gas line side, because most gas lines are either a gray or white color. And this is the liquid line. So in this case, this is one that has star sand in it. So I'm going to crack this open just uh, a little bit. I'll hold this back here so you can kind of see what it looks like. In this case, I'm going to let the excess material in here uh, flow into the into the sketch bucket, and then we'll throw away the contents. So you can see a little bit of uh, dark material that's in there, and that's from a previous uh, year that we had. So once that gets uh, run through there a little bit. The line's pretty well sanitized. Um, a lot of times I'll just leave the sanitizer in there uh, until the next time I brew. And I definitely, without exception, uh, very rare exceptions, will keep this in my uh, kegerator because uh, if everything's cold, there's less chance <coughs> excuse me, of bacteria and things start to crop themselves up. Now this other line, uh, this is a gas line. It's kind of hard to see underneath this tape, but this is kind of a cool little adapter. Um, this actually fits right on to your MFL connections that normally will go on the end of your, your ball lock uh, connectors. And what this does is just simply threads on to the end of this. And now it's the equivalent of a, of a fitting uh, for, your, for your ball lock keg. So now I can take the CO2 tank and at any time I want without having to unscrew all sorts of connections, just click this on and now I've got uh, CO2 for my counter pressure filler. So it's kind of a handy uh, little deal. I, I got this one from Adventures in Homebrewing, uh, but there's probably other sites that have it as well. Now this container here is filled with star sand, and I like to keep everything put in there between fills. So the, the, the cork on top, everything comes in contact with the beer is now sitting in sanitizer. Okay, we're back and uh, actually you probably notice I switched to a second regulator. Um, I don't need the second one here, but uh, this has multiple output. Uh, normally in my kegs, uh, my kegerators, I've got manifolds on it, but for this demo here, kind of have to, to go with the uh, transported uh, CO2 system. So just kind of recap. So I've got this uh, uh, CO2 line going to this adapter, which is on the counter flow pressure filler. So that gives me the counter flow the pre pressurization for the beer. Uh, this is the uh, other CO2 line for the, the gas side of the, uh, what we're going to be pouring out here, which is a raspberry cider. So in this case, uh, it's nice to have the bottles cool, but with counter pressure fillers, really not all that important, uh, just because uh, you don't have the effervescence issues that you normally do with, with other systems. So I've got this sitting in star sand, so I'll use this throughout the, the brewing process and then throw this out once I'm done. And it just ensures that I've always got a sanitized uh, condition whenever I do my beers. So I'm going to go ahead and put this on. This uh, slide looks like it might have beer in it, but actually over time, especially dark beers, it, they tend to stain even when you run cleaner through them. Uh, so, yeah, it's the way it goes. So I run star sand through this already. Uh, so it's been sanitized. Yeah, I'm going to open this up just a little bit. I'm going to crack this open. So. This is the beer side, and then in this case the cider side, and this is the gas side. So I'm going to open this up and I'm going to flow the cider through here, so that way the line gets completely full of uh, the cider, and uh, we can get ready to fill the bottles. This is a raspberry apple cider, so it's got a real nice uh, red flavor to it. And We've got the bottles here. I'm going to put the bottles up front so you can sort of see the process. Now the, uh, the way this thing seems to work best for me is uh, 
I'll go ahead and put that in. There's two holes in here, so this actually purges the line and, uh, and purges the, the beer bottle itself. And then what happens on the other end is this is actually a little valve to bleed off the CO2 gas that's in there. And then this is just, uh, you know, foam and extra CO2 exhausting out of this line. And all my controls for this uh, filling is all from here. So I can stop the flow completely by shutting this off so the beer can't go through anymore because the pressures are equal in the bottle and the tank. Um, and then I can make it flow faster or slower, however I feel like it. So, once we get to this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. There's a lot of different ways to purge this. I kind of like to, to burp the line because as you lift this uh, cork out quickly, um, it actually exhausts out so quick, it actually puts a little bit of a partial vacuum in the bottom, and so that actually gets the uh, CO2 out more effectively. Okay, we're back. Uh, memory card got full. So. Um, as I was recapping here, um, the CO2 tank, I've got this set at just under 15 psi. Um, that's going to give me roughly two and a quarter volumes off the top of my head. Um, and that's kind of a nice volume for, uh, in this case, a cider. Um, so once we have the bottle, and actually while we're taking a break too, I switch bottles. Um, this is actually, I didn't realize, I was trying to get one clear so you could see a little bit better. Uh, this has a screw top. I'll go through the whole thing of putting on the cap, but uh, unfortunately the cap won't work on that one. But at least you can see the whole process in here. So in this case, uh, you know, again, we'll want to, uh, it doesn't hurt to chill it down a little bit, even though we're using a counter pressure filler. Just a little bit less foam, a little less lost uh, liquid. So just to recap on this, um, gas side and liquid, and then this one is the vent. So that vents out the CO2 and the foam off the top. Um, this cork actually I made this, <laughs> this is terrible, but <laughs> uh, give me my nerdiness, but I actually cast this out of a, um, a silicone rubber mold making compound so you can kind of make whatever size you want. And I like this just because this will fit in very easily. It's very, very pliable, very rubbery, uh, soft, and uh, it's very easy to hold pressure in there without having to push down real hard. And because of the taper, I can fill anything all the way up to and including growlers under counter pressure filling. So it's very cool having a growler that will go for a month before it goes flat. Um, so anyway, we're going to put this in to the bottle and put a you know reasonably firm pressure on there and go ahead and open this up and so basically what's happening in there you can see if I lift up real quick you get a real fast burst of CO2 and a little bit of mixed air do that three or four times goes pretty quick might be a couple more times if I'm doing a competition just to be safe and once that's done, and I don't hear any more flow, I'll go ahead and shut this off. Now before I turn this on, because I don't know if these two pressures are absolutely identical, and the main thing is I want this pressure to be less than pressure in the CO2 tank. If it isn't, you're going to get pressure shooting back into your, in this case, cider, and you're going to mix up everything that's settled out over the last month. So we're good to go on that, so I'm going to just barely crack this and rotate this a little bit. I also normally have a, a long, almost shoebox looking thing that collects any foam or anything that comes over. Uh, but just for this, uh, you know, I'm going to make it a little bit easier to see. So that's closed. Now I'm going to vent this a little bit. And then I'll go ahead and open this up completely full. And because the line is, some beers or cider sat in there for a little bit, there's a little bit more foaming than you normally would see, but still not too bad. And uh, just go as slow or as fast as you see. If you go too quick, you're going to get a whole lot of foam coming up. And one thing I like about having the, the CO2 come in at the top, if it's a little bit too foamy, you can shut this thing off and you can see that the flow is completely stopped and kind of gives everything to, time to equilibrate a little bit 
gives that gas pressure time to build up pressure in the head space and uh, it kind of allows you to, to uh, have less foaming. So go ahead and crack it open a little bit. Now during competition, uh, fill height is important, but you're not going to get deducted points if it's too high or too low a little bit. So after you do a couple of these, you're going to find out the, the, the volume that the fill tube takes up. It's going to drop that length down a little bit. And so uh, I can go ahead and vent this out. And you can see as you go, vent too quickly, uh, you'll get a lot of foam coming out. If you get too much foam, it's not a big deal. You can just come back in here and, and top it off again. But we're going to slowly let that go. And uh, the other thing too, this, this uh, cider's been sitting at room temperature. Actually, it's probably about 90 degrees right here. So it's going to uh, foam up a little bit more than it normally would. But not a big deal. We're just going to show the whole process. And once, uh, you're going to see bubbles coming up, but once you don't see a whole lot of foam coming out of the other end, then you can go ahead and take this off and uh, have your, your capper have ready. Because sometimes it's going to foam and you'll have just a short amount of time to get the cap on there. This goes back in the sanitizer. And then uh, go ahead and cap this on. And yeah, like I say, this doesn't really cap it because uh, it's a screw on top, so I guess we'll be forced to drink it. I guess it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, so there you have it. Now we'll go to the next section here. We're going to do uh, one without the counter pressure filling. You can still do a pretty good job, but uh, you know, we'll give you the demo on that as well. Well, welcome back. Um, we switched things out, so the previous segment we were doing counter pressure filling, where we have a CO2 back pressure, and really what makes it kind of nice amongst other things is the CO2 purges the headspace, and we have uh, just one PSI difference in pressure, so that's why you don't see all the foaming that you normally do with non counter pressure filling. So we're switching over this one, and there's there's a lot of different gizmos. I've made a few different ones. Uh, this is just the picnic tap, which I am going to show on this one. Um, there's some other stainless steel valves, and uh, a whole host of other uh, gadgets to to do your filling with. Um, one thing I have on here, I put a little adapter, and really what this is, it's a uh, a couple of hoses. One's a 316 ID beer line hose on top of a little bit slightly bigger hose, and I just wired it on there. And what's kind of nice is air conditioner tubing, which is quarter inch OD, seems to fit in the 316 ID beer line really well. It's got a pretty good secure seal on it, so I kind of like it, and it's you know totally food compatible, uh, very inert to acids and alkalis as well. So. Um, what I did on this one is added just one little more level of uh, back pressure and this is just a cork and you can get these at your homebrew shop. It's got a quarter inch ID OD big, big enough to uh, effectively fit into uh, the, a beer bottle pretty well. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, run it over here. This is our sanitizer. So just make sure that's clean, especially if you've run beers in before. Um, no, sorry, not sanitizer, this is Star Sand, so this is, uh, you know, just basically a sanitizer. If you had some lines are pretty dirty, you may want to go with the cleaner first and then go with your sanitizer. So now we're done with that. I'm going to go ahead and pop this up. And uh, this is a little vent, vent stick I call it. It's actually a piece of uh, the glue gun stick that I can put in there, sanitize it, open this valve up. The gravity finish it out, and uh, that cleans cleans the uh, lines pretty effectively. So go ahead and uh, lock this on here. Shut this off so you don't have any surprises, unwanted surprises. 
So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and run a little bit of uh, liquid through there. This has been sanitized, and you can always just run that through again. I run a little bit of liquid, and, and what this does is kind of purging the line of uh, the, the gases that basically just air, but also it's going to cool the line a little bit too. Now what you want to do in this case, which is going to be different than the previous one where we had CO2 pressure on here, you want to take this off. Okay? So if you try to fill something with 12 or 14 psi on the end of that, it's going to be not very fun. So I'm going to go ahead and vent this, not completely, but almost all the way. Right about there. So now when I turn this on, I can uh, get just a tiny amount through there. But we have the bottle here. Again, our bottle that you can't put a cap on it, but you can uh, see the fill on it. And put that in there and just hold this on. Now, you may have times where this is not going to want to completely fill in there. So what you can do is take a little break um, and put your valve back on. You can. I have a switch on this, and so what I think I'll do is go ahead and turn that off for now, and then if I need it, I can quickly turn that back on. So now when we run through here, there really isn't any CO2 in here, but the moment that it hits the bottom of the bottle, the, the CO2 is going to come out of solution, so you're going to have a little bit of a blanket of CO2 on the, on the top of that uh, cider in this case. So what kind of helps out a little bit is I can go ahead and burp the line a little bit. I'm just kind of lift, um, what I'm doing is I'm just lifting up on this line just very slightly. And what that's doing is keeping a head pressure in the bottle itself while allowing the, uh, the cider to come through without a whole lot of trouble. And at the same time, that CO2 is providing a nice little blanket of uh, protection from oxygen, which is always our mortal enemy, except for if we need to breathe. And I'm throttling this a little bit too, so I can just gradually open it. And this is where you want to have, I'm not going to put this down now, I'll clean up later, but this is where you want to have a container just to collect the overflow. Because you are going to get some. Now we'll just kind of burp that a little bit. Let the gases come out. The other thing I like to do on this, if, I, if I'm going back to the non-counterflow pressure filler, is I'll have a little squeeze bottle so I, there's no oxygen in it, per se. And you can use that squeeze bottle then to uh, top off the bit. You can do this too, just keep it up at the top there a little. And then I can uh, bleed this a little bit more. So just, it's coming out very slowly. And uh, that'll give us just enough back pressure to, to finish it out. So you get some foam on top, but it's, it's not a big deal. And that height right there is just about right. Um, and this is where you can use the oxygenating cap and seal that on. The other thing too, so I can make a complete mess over here, um, is let's say you don't have the oxygenating caps and you just want to go with the standard cap. One way you can do this, once it gets full, and you kind of have to be pretty quick at it, or I'm just going to show you this and not worry too much about capping it. Um, have this at the ready. But just go ahead and tap on this. And with a plastic uh, screwdriver in, in this case, works pretty well. And once you get a couple of uh, little bursts, you're going to see that's going to come up. And what that's doing is it's basically venting the head space of uh, air and now you purge it pretty well. So now when you lock that that cap on there, then you would have uh, that headspace pretty well purged out. So anyway, there's the, the two different methods. So just to recap um, with this method, picnic tap uh, onto the, in this case, a cider, little cork there um, that fits into the beer bottle. 
a very important bend this almost all the way, uh, maybe 89%. You're going to get a feel for it after a couple of times. And then keep this flow going because every time this you stop for X amount of minutes, this gets warm and you've got to get a lot of CO, uh, CO2 coming out of solution. So um, there you go. And uh, you know, just keep your bottle in cold water or keep it in the freezer with an aluminum foil, sanitized foil over the top so you don't have any bugs get in there. And then just be uh, quick about your fill. So there you go. Thanks. Okay, we're back and uh, gone through quite a few different things. We've uh, gone through filling your, your beers and ciders and uh, meads with counter pressure, regular fillers, sanitation, um, some little tips and tricks with uh, kegs and things like that. And uh, first part of the, of the segment, you saw me cutting up uh, an inner tube. And uh, actually, it's not really being cheap. I guess maybe part of it is, but you know, rubber bands are pretty inexpensive. But I found uh, unless you buy them fresh all the time, they, they kind of crack and get old, and uh, they're not very not very reliable. And if you lose that top deal, uh, then uh, you're out of luck. So um, this is from a, a road bike, bigger inner tube. If you have competitions that require you put it on the the body of the ball instead of the neck, uh, so kind of two different two different uh, means of keeping this attached. So what I've done on this, I've attached this uh, label, which is going to be what you have for your competition. So when you enter your beers or ciders or meads, uh, it'll have a printout, and these are fairly small. And the reason why is uh, Nelson Crowley had a pretty good point. He says, and you know all the I don't even know how many competitions he's run or been a part of. But uh, when you put the, the label around here, they normally go into six pack, there's humidity, and these labels can get lost or torn. So he says, you know, I suggest put them up on the deck. I like the idea. So um, instead of using the larger inner tube, I went with the smaller road bike tube. So when you get done, take a look at your descriptor. And uh, make sure when you've got any things that require additional information, such as some of the fruit needs, uh, fruit specialty beers, bells and specialties, make sure that's on there. And then just go ahead and uh, put that on. It doesn't really matter where the rubber band goes, but just lock it up like that. And uh, secondly, when you look on the, the number, there's a real long, in this case, 104, and there's a lot of zeros, and then there's the last three digits. That's really the three digits that we'll use for the competition to know what beer it is, who entered the beer, and what category it's going to. So for me, uh, I really don't want to lose anybody's beers. And what I will ask you to do, just take a Sharpie on the top, a magic marker. And in this case, you know, it's uh, category or entry number 000214. So I'm going to put 214 up there, and that's all you need. So if this ever gets lost, gets torn, something happens, uh, we can always reference this label up here. And we're going to put a round sticky label up here anyway that's going to be a judging number. So, you know, we'll, we'll uh, mask that off so nobody knows whose beer is in what category if they're sitting there judging and also have beers in the entry. So uh, that's pretty much for all these segments. and. Uh, We'll hope to do a few more in the future, but uh, hopefully this will get you through. And then uh, don't forget in the, uh, the other attached segment in this, this complete uh, uh, learning uh, tutorial as we'll go through showing you uh, what steps to go through for this particular Reggie Beer competition category. So good luck, and uh, as they say, brew, brew good. Thanks.